Hello, this is John O'Bacon, and thank you for joining me here for my keynote here at the Inner Source Summit. I'm so excited to be here and so thankful to the organizational team for inviting me to come and speak. Now, if you've seen me speak before, you may notice that my voice is a little gravelier than usual, and that's because I've got a giant stinking cold right now. It turns out that if you don't go outside for two years and then you go outside, you catch all of the things, and I proceeded to catch all of the things. So, um, no. I know what you're thinking, suspicious minds. I don't have COVID, I've been tested, but I do have a horrible cold and I'm gonna ask you to forgive me as I sound gravelly and hopefully not too congested as I go through this. Now, my session today is called, is called Convincing the Unconvincible and this is all about how to build buy-in. Like one of the biggest challenges I've seen with InnerSource and people bringing in a source into an organization is convincing the people around them that this is going to be a good methodology and getting them involved in delivering some success, okay? <clears throat> now, the background here is that I used to lead community at GitHub uh, Canonical and XPRIZE, and then I got into consulting. And I've been consulting now for about 12 years. Um, five years full-time and beyond that, I used to do it on the side. And I, while I work for many, I work with many smaller companies like HackerOne and Matamos and Data.World, many of my clients are much larger, larger organizations like Santander and Deutsche Bank and Airbnb and Google and, and Microsoft and places like this. And many of my clients have brought me in to help them build an inner source program because of my heritage in open source. Now, one of the biggest challenges that they face is getting people on board because you've got to, by definition, get people collaborating together to make inner source work. So what I'm going to share with you in this session are going to be some really practical things that you can do right now to build buy-in, not just in inner source, but in anything else you want to focus on as well. Now, I originally titled this presentation Convincing the Unconvincible, but this is actually the wrong title because I want to talk about the philosophy, uh, philosophy of this first because this is not about convincing. Okay, convincing is the wrong way in which we approach any change in workflow or any change in culture because convincing kind of presupposes that you're going to assemble all of the information and the arguments and the data and the science. You can assemble it together and then you're going to lecture your way to an outcome. Okay? Nobody wants that. Nobody likes to be on the receiving end of that because emotion will play a huge role in how we make decisions, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. You know, you can have the best argument for, it, for inner sourcing possible. People are going to have fear and anxiety and uncertainty and they're going to have just cultural comfort that they're, that they're used to focusing on that they don't want to disrupt, okay? So what we really want to focus on is, is how we help people to see and feel the value of inner source as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And it's this seeing and feeling value which is the core of what I'm covering in my keynote today. Now let me paint a picture for you. Imagine you see a really cool company online called Knight Industries. And you think they look pretty interesting because they're, they're creating this awesome like in-car technology, okay? Now, some of the older farts in the organ audience may recognize some of these pictures, but I'll just leave it to you to identify with the rest of everybody in the chat what this is, okay? Um, now, you join this company, and part of the reason why you join this company is because the CEO is, like, super inspiring. You think he, he's got all kinds of amazing ideas, and people really seem to admire him as well in the company, and it just seems like a good company culture, okay? You join and you go and, and start talking to various people about inner source. And the first person you talk to is the, is the woman who runs engineering. And she's super excited about it because <clears throat> her team is very familiar with open source. They use open source in some of the infrastructure. Um, you know, their team, her team goes to KubeCon and the Open Source Summit, all things open, all these great events. And they love the idea of it. So the idea of building internal open source is very exciting to her. Likewise, when you go and talk to some of her team members, they're also super excited about it because what developer doesn't want to work with other developers writing code together in an open and transparent way? It's incredibly fulfilling. Who wouldn't want that, okay? So they're obviously on board. But then you go and talk to the product team and they are less convinced. And why are they less convinced? Well, it's because the customers have got a billion different things that they want to see in the product. The executives have got all of their little kind of pet requirements that they want to see. And then the engineering team is constantly busy and overbooked. And it's the product team that has to try and figure out how to balance all of this. So they've got enough on their plate. They don't want to have to worry about all of this weird inner source stuff that keeps being talked about inside of the company. So they're not convinced. But you know who is really unconvinced and who can really stand in the way of this? Yep, it's the head of legal, okay? And this guy, he's not very nice. Frankly, you'd never invite him to a party. Wouldn't be much fun. 
Um, but all he sees is risk. He's incentivized uh, to mitigate risk. He just sees all of the potential problems with Innersource. And in reality, there's not a lot of risk with Innersource, but he sees the world through a slightly different and rather depressing lens, okay? So we need to build buy-in across these folks. The engineering uh, lead, she's great. The engineers, they're great. It's product and legal we want to kind of get on board, okay? Now, we've got some ground rules now we're going to approach this, okay? The first thing that we need to agree on is that inner source and open source is weird, okay? Now, I want you to repeat after me. I know this is weird. You sat at home and this kind of balding English guy is asking you to recite something out loud, but I want you to do this, okay? Repeat after me. I know this is weird. I know it's weird. Repeat after me. Inner source. Come on. Come on. Inner source and open source is weird. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. We got that out of the way. It is weird. You know, think about open source. The idea that companies, many of which compete with each other, come together to work on the same code, that's weird. The idea that uh, billion dollar companies have been building software for free, that's weird, right? The idea that you uh, create code and other people you don't know review your code and provide criticism and feedback and how to improve it out in the open in front of everybody, that's weird, right? Inside of the open source world, inside of the inner source world, it doesn't seem weird, but it's totally weird. So we can't go into this and, and again, lecture your audience and say, it's not weird, don't be ridiculous. This is how the world works. We need to acknowledge and understand and validate that they've got these concerns so we can address them. And this is all about breaking objections. We wanna break through the concerns that they've got, but to break the objections, we need to understand them, which we'll get to in just a second, okay? The other element that's a ground rule here is that collaboration is key. If you go away and produce a 50-page PowerPoint deck with the world's greatest argument for why inner source is valuable, you won't succeed, right? You need to start small, get feedback from other people, have a conversation and drive it as, as a discussion as opposed to a presentation, okay? And the thing here as well is that knowledge isn't everything. We need to get to proof first, okay? Again, if you deliver the 50-page PowerPoint deck, you're gonna be much less successful than if you manage to talk to a couple of developers, one of which on, on, on different teams, and they work on a 100-line Python script that maybe pulls information off a website and presents it to a, an API. Um, and each developer contributes to that one script and you see that it works and they both have a good experience, that's way more co compelling than sitting through an hour and a half with someone waffling on through a PowerPoint presentation. You see, the key thing here is that, again, emotion drives decisions and it drives buy-in. So when we identify those objections, we address them, that's when we, can, that's when we can make the seed change. And throughout this whole process, less is more. Don't do the 50-page PowerPoint deck. Start with one page inside of a Google Doc or an Office 365 Doc, or if you want to be funky, a LibreOffice Doc. If you want to be really funky, WordPerfect Doc. Is WordPerfect still around? Dunno. Anyway, let's move on to the practical methodology. All right, step one. <clears throat> so the first thing you want to do is create a short list of, quote, key people. Now, what I mean by this is the people who will likely be consulted in a decision around how software is built. So this could be um, a head of engineering, or it could be um, a head of product. It could be key developers in the team um, that are very influential in the group. It doesn't necessarily have to be defined by hierarchy, okay? And step one is all about just getting to know people, right? Just reach out to folks, have a conversation with them, grab a coffee, grab a lunch. If you want to go out and have a beer, that's fine as well. Whatever's best, and just focus on understanding their world. And you want to really focus on three primary things. The first thing is what sucks about their life? What is difficult about how they build software? Understand the pain points that they experience because we're going to architect inner sources and means of resolving those pain points. Then focus on what are their goals? Where do they want to get to? And what roadblocks are standing in the way of those goals? When we understand those, not only by you being an active listener and listening to this, get it all off their chest, not only will that build trust in them with you, but it will also give you tons and tons of ammunition that you can use to position your inner source strategy in the most effective way. Stage, step two is to now focus on what are the practical technology problems that we should focus on. So when you went through that process of listening to those folks, when you probe and facilitate, you will get all kinds of potential ideas <coughs> for where you could focus on a technology uh, solution, okay? So let's say, for example, you've got 
let's say you've got uh, a mobile team here in a bank and you've got a web team here in a bank and they're both pulling information from various resources to display banking information in their respective place in the cell phone app and, or mobile app and on the, on the website, okay? But they're both replicating how they get that information and scrape it. Wouldn't it be cool as one technology solution to create a lightweight library that both teams will contribute development time into and then they can both use the same library? Um, that means that, you know, the work gets done once, you get better security, all of those different benefits, okay? So that's a good example of where you could have a technology solution, okay? So think about what those are gonna be. Explore what kind of value you could offer and make sure that the value that you're proposing here clearly serves those pain points and roadblocks. That's the most critical piece. If you don't serve those pain points and roadblocks, then there's a likelihood that you won't get the buy-in that you need, okay? So sketch out some of these themes and then follow up with those people and say, so I was thinking about what you were saying about you know, some of the challenges that you got, and I was thinking maybe we could consolidate these two different projects into one, or maybe we could come up with another lightweight project around this, and then the goal that we've got is someone to say, oh, wow, yeah, that would be really helpful. You want them to think that would be helpful, but I don't know how to do that, and that's where you're gonna come in and help them do it, okay? All right, let's move on to step three. Now what we wanna do is to build a simple straw man in how we get to that. So I'm gonna use my example here of the mobile app and the web app. Um, and you know, we build this kind of shared library that's gonna present information to both of these different surfaces to render it, okay? Now, how, what do you do with that library? What you wanna do is you wanna create a 30, 60, and 90 day plan, right? So in the first 30 days, the idea is to just get something written and get something working okay, that it's a proof of concept that it's gonna run. In the next 30 days, you wanna focus on broader collaboration. So bring in, bringing in more engineering resources or getting it baked into those different um, platforms. I mean, that's gonna be a little tight in 60 days, but just getting the team more invested in it. Now they've seen that first quick win. And then for the next 30 days, it's gonna be about really kind of leaving that 90 day period with a very clear organizational win. So you can say, we, we trialed this, we had this idea around this, this library, we did it, it's benefiting both teams, both teams will say, yeah, this is awesome, this is well worth our time, boom, we now have a win. Now, you may be working for an organization where the, the wheels turn very slowly, and you may need to change these numbers. I admit that 30, 60, and 90 days is a little ambitious, okay, but you've got to pitch it to a timeline. If you don't pitch it to a timeline, it just won't happen, okay? So for you, it may be 60, 120, and 180 days. That's totally fine, but make sure you bake a timeline into it. And then what you do is you come up with an idea for how this is gonna work. You review it with the people you already spoke to, your stakeholders. You invite really blunt feedback, okay? You gotta say to people, and I like to say this when I'm working with clients, I am unoffendable, okay? I want to hear your blunt feedback. I want you to tell me where I can improve and refine and optimize this so I can make better decisions. Okay, so invite that. Listen, be receptive, evolve your plan, and then go back to them. And that's how we move, move the needle, okay? <clears throat> and then step four. Now we've kind of got that idea with those key stakeholders in place. Now go and socialize it with other people. And the first place you're gonna to wanna to start this is with, is with developers. These are the people who are gonna be knee deep in code. These are the people who are gonna be submitting code and having it reviewed with their peers and their colleagues and all the rest of it. Go there first, go and ask them what they think. And most developers are generally cool with this kind of thing. Most developers like the idea of open source and participation. They'll have some reservations, but then you can address them and deal with them in the plan. Then what you do is you go to the managers. These are the people that developers are reporting into. Now you may be thinking, but Jono, why wouldn't I go to the managers first and then go and talk to their teams? The reason why is because any good engineering manager or CTO worth their salt knows full well that if they can't keep their developers happy, they won't have much of a job for much longer, okay? Their developers are the lifeblood of their team and their employment, okay? So if you go to the developers and get their buy-in, by definition, you're gonna influence those managers, okay? It's a little sneaky, but you know what? When we're talking about inner source and open source, I don't mind being sneaky, okay? That's how we're gonna do it. That makes sense? Okay, now, doing all of this requires a little bit of a tightrope walk because what you're gonna find as you go through this process is you're gonna end up dealing with some difficult people. Um, and, you know, we see these folks all the, t all the time in businesses, right? People, you have a great idea, a lot of people have kind of bought into it, and then there's always kind of a stick in the mud who's not really sure about it. 
people who are overly conservative are stuck to their existing ways of working. And it's easy to be dismissive of these people. But at the end of the day, part of the reason why a lot of people have these viewpoints is because um, the reason why there's been a consistent drip feed of success is because they've kept a steady hand on what's going on, okay? But we need to deal with these if we want to make any kind of, these folks if we want to make any kind of change, okay? But I want to provide a caveat before I get into some of these personalities. And that is that while I'm going to talk about how to deal with some more complicated, difficult people, you should never ever accept bullying, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, or any other kind of hate speech, okay? I'm not suggesting throughout any of this that you should ever accept that. You know, there are various uh, people who I've worked with in my career where they've had somebody who's just been a complete a-hole um, to them. And I've said, like, that's unacceptable. You should not, you should not accept that way of, of them speaking to you. I would go and talk to them about it. And, you know, if, they, if they're not going to resolve it, then go and talk to your manager or go and talk to HR, whatever it might be. So I'm not advocating this. However, there are a lot of people out there who... Um, who are not bullying, they're not racist, they're not sexist, they're not homophobic, they're not transphobic, but they are difficult to get on board with your programs. And those are the folks I want to talk about right now, okay? Now, there are some ground rules in how we deal with people who are, you know, objectors to our strategy, okay? The first one is you've got to be the better person. It's easy in these kinds of situations to let emotion to overrule our approach um, um, and to get frustrated and to personalize the issue with somebody. When you personalize any kind of disagreement, that is the worst possible situation to be in because then you'll see the character flaws of the other person as opposed to the argument. As the old saying goes, always attack the idea, not the individual, okay? So always take the high road with these kinds of things. The other thing you're gonna to wanna to focus on is evidence and strategy. If somebody says, well, I like your idea for this kind of, this module, this library that we will share, but you know, um, I'm not convinced that we've got the resourcing or that it's going to work or this, that, and the other. Well, what you do then is you say, well, okay, well, why don't we try this really simplified, small version of this? It will take an hour of somebody's time. We'll see how it works, then we'll go to something else, right? So you're solving their objections with practical action, and you need to find the practical action where they've really got no way in which they can say, ah, yeah, you know, I don't really want to do that. You want to make sure that they're always in a position where they're supported, okay? And then certainly never, ever write people off. I know it's easy to do. I know it's, I've worked with so many people. I'm like, God, I just, they're just a lost cause. Like these people, they're, I don't believe there is any such thing. I think everybody has an opportunity for change in their lives, in their relationships, in their work, okay? It's just about finding the sweet spot about what they're unclear on, what they're uncertain about, and helping them to feel at ease with this change that we're suggesting. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna take a sip of water. So the evil cold, hopefully not COVID, does not continue. All right. So the first person I want to talk about, uh, this is the let's dial it back person, okay? We've all been in these kinds of meetings where you're chatting to somebody and they say, you know what? Let's say you've had a couple of meetings uh, 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 already about an inner source program. It's the second or the third meeting. They say, okay, let's just kind of dial this back and get to like, what are we trying to do here, right? We've all... Well, many of us have worked with these kinds of people. Typically, the reason why people do that is because they've not been paying attention. Um, there's been lots of conversation. They've been zoned out, doing their email, or playing Fortnite or whatever. They haven't been paying attention. And they're, let's just dial it back and figure out what we're doing here is their opportunity to, in a veiled way, catch up. Okay? So what you want to do is you want to identify that alignment is the issue here. You want to say, okay, well... Let's take a step back and let's make sure we're aligned on some of these fundamental principles and what we're trying to do here. And you validate them in the call. So, okay, so we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this. Do you agree? Yep, okay, now. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna deliver this kind of value and there's gonna be these opportunities that are attached to the value. Do you agree with this, okay? And if they say they agree there. Now what you do is you ask them to basically say, well, where is there the deficit? Where is the problem? Where is there the gap in the strategy that we're forming and ask them to identify it, okay? What you don't wanna do is have this ethereal general concept, well, you know, what are we, what are we really trying to do here? Like, it's such a general question, um, and children play that game, right? Frankly, kids play that game. So you wanna put them in a position where they're gonna, you, you, you align on 
the goal? Like, we're, are we aligned on this opportunity? Are we aligned on some of these steps? Yes, 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 and yes. Keep moving it forward until they say what they're not aligned on. Identify that as a strategic deficit, and then identify steps to resolve that deficit and get them to commit, okay? Make sure that you get commitment in an email or in a document so they don't go and play this let's dial it back card again. All right, do we agree? Okay. Another kind of person you may see is the, I don't see the value person, okay? So this is usually gonna be, well, you know, I just, I don't really understand why we're gonna do this. Like we've gotten, we've been building software for years and it's totally fine. Like why do we need to do this kind of weird inner source thing? There's gonna be way more penguins kind of around the office and you know, I, it's, it's weird. Um, <laughs> well, when they say they don't see the value of this, ask them for what they define value as. Right, like, well, what do you see as the core value of what we're trying to do here? What are those first principles, right? And then what you wanna do is you wanna augment that and say, okay, well, this is the value that I believe we can create, or we believe we can create here, and these are the stages in which we got to a point where we validated this. So for example, if they say, well, you know, to me, value is delivering, you know, stable, consistent, high quality software, then you say, well, I agree with that, right? But to me, the way in which we can achieve that value more efficiently and more effectively is if we're working together, right? And when we do that work out in the open internally in a GitHub repo, for example, when we do that uh, and it creates greater accountability for the work that we're doing, then that's gonna mean that we can rev the software quicker, we get high levels of security, going back to Linus's law of, you know, with enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. I think that was Linus's law, it might be somebody else's law. Um, uh, put it in the chat if I got it wrong. Um, then we'll, that's the value we can get to, okay? And again, then what you do is you, if they're, if they're unconvinced, say, well, what is, where are you, what's the missing piece that I'm not seeing? This is one of the ways I like to present this, to say, what am I missing out here? And then ask them to, to clarify that. Then again, you identify next steps, you get some commitments. And then also, I like to ask like, well, what can I be do to help, um, like, how, what feedback should I be getting um, to help us all be successful? You know, like, what am I missing? What are those blind spots to help us to drive this project in the right direction? Now, another person that you may see as we go through this process is the tech nerd. The person where every time you have a conversation about something, they bring it back down to which specific version of Jenkins you're using or which specific kernel you're using, um, you know, or how do we align these two different systems together <clears throat> where they only want to talk about the difference between GitHub issues and Jira, okay? And I think it's always important to acknowledge the importance of the technology there. This is usually engineers who tend to do this. But, um, you know, you want to kind of rezone this and you want to say, oh, okay, let's take a step back around what we're trying to achieve here with the strategic, like what we're actually trying to build here with the software. And then when we get alignment there, then we can have a meaningful conversation about the technology, right? If you say to them like, I don't really wanna talk about the technology right now because we haven't figured out like what the game plan is yet, right? And then we can kind of, once we've defined the game plan, then we can have a, a much more practical conversation about the technology at that point. And then you can tie it in. And then the other person that you might deal with from time to time is the a-hole, okay? I'm not sure whether swearing is allowed at the Inner Source Summit, so I'm not gonna say the word, but you both, you both know, hopefully there's more than two of you watching, but you all know what those two little asterisks there mean, right? So um, this is the person who is just difficult to deal with. They have a uh, potentially um, contentious um, personality. They have some animos about them. Often these people have been burning out, they're frustrated, um, they're annoyed. The first thing I like to do is to say, okay, let's just take a step back. Let's take a breath, everybody. And, you know, let's say the person's called John. All right, John, I'd like you to share with us, like, I, I can tell that you're frustrated. Um, tell us what your areas of concern and frustration are, okay? And what they'll do is they, they, they get that out there. And I like to validate it where it makes sense. This is a great way of building trust with people. Let's say John says, yeah, well, we've tried all this kind of stuff before and it just hasn't worked. If somebody said that to me, I'd be like, <clears throat> I'd be saying, yeah, I mean, that's gotta be really frustrating, right? This probably feels like, you know, oh, yet another program that we're all gonna have to kind of get into and then it'll get shut down after six months, right? 
and Jong Bro, uh, yeah, 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 right? So by acknowledging those concerns, we build trust, puts you in a position where you can resolve them, okay? So the first thing I like to do is get those concerns out on the table and say, okay, well, that's great, right? I'm sensing this friction, but let's now identify some ways in which we can rectify this and deal with those individual concerns, okay? And you discuss those individual ways, um, and then again, you document them. So if John says, we've tried these kinds of programs before and they just haven't been successful, then what I would say, and logically in that moment, would be, okay, well, <clears throat> I think to rectify your concerns, John, let's go and take a look at what you did the last time and let's identify what didn't work about it. So let's say part of the problem that it didn't work is that there wasn't enough time made available to staff to do this kind of inner source work. Well, I think we should take that and let's have a conversation with the leadership about how we make that time available or we set those expectations more effectively. So then what's happening is that the a-hole, who was just annoyed and frustrated and snappy at people, now what you're doing is you're taking their concerns, you've recognized useful information in them, they're now part of the strategy and now John is gonna be much more on board, okay? Again, never accept hostility throughout any of this because it's just not gonna be okay, all right? All right, so as I bring this into the, into the finish line, a couple of final thoughts. The first thing is, you may be thinking, but the people I work with are different. This won't, uh, this won't work with them. I guarantee you this approach will work. This is a human beings thing, right? And human beings are, frankly, relatively consistent in, in, around the world. So I would just try it, you know? I mean, you may have some reservations about whether the things that I'm recommending here are gonna work for you, but the only way to test that is gonna be to try it. You know, the wrong way to do it is to think, well, this just won't work for me, so I'm not gonna even bother. Well, you'll never be successful, you know? Um, don't get buried in what ifs, because what ifs can be paralyzing, okay? So I would definitely try it. The, the second thing that you may be thinking here is, well, I need more experience to deliver these approaches. You know, Jono, you've been working in open source for 22 years. Like, I've been working in, 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 in my business for two years, right? I wouldn't worry about that. The best way to develop that experience is to chat to people. Go and talk to other people in other businesses, other people who are here at the Inner Source Summit about what they've done. You're, my door is nailed open. Drop me an email to jono at jonobacon.com. You know, I would love to hear anything that you've, any questions that you've got. I'm happy to answer anything that relates to this. So don't worry about not having the experience. This is the core of everything I've been sharing in this keynote is about having a real human conversation and validating the, the people who are not bought in to understand them, right? To understand them and to work to help them and to help alleviate those concerns as opposed to creating a perfect courtroom argument about open source and inner source. And then the other thing you may be thinking, but I'm, I'm nervous, I'm scared, you know? And I get this, like, I, I don't blame you. Doing anything new is nervous, is nerve wracking and, and scary. And, um, but here's the thing, the things that are worth it are nerve wracking and scary, right? The way in which we grow, the way in which we evolve is, is to put ourselves in positions where we're outside of our comfort zone. I spent too long in my comfort zone in, in the early stage of my career, and it was the biggest mistake I ever made. Uh, and what broke that was when I, really like when I left, especially when I left Canonical, went to XPRIZE, brand new area of focus. And it was invigorating kind of getting out there and doing something. And when you do something new and you succeed, you start feeling pretty, um, pretty invincible. And that's a pretty cool feeling. So don't worry about being, ner being nervous. It's perfectly natural. Get out there and say to your brain, I'm not going to let you control me. I'm going get to out, get out there and do it. All right. All righty. I hope this was useful. I'm going to just before I wrap up, I've got a book out, it's called People Powered. Um, it won a Business Book Awards uh, uh, award uh, in, like, last year. It's a bestseller on Amazon and Goodreads. I'm pretty proud of it. It talks a lot about how to build communities inside a business as well as outside. Uh, if you're interested in it, you can go to johnobacon.com forward slash pack. Um, and if you pop in your first name and your email address, I like to send loads of good stuff out. So I'll send you <coughs> a couple of free chapters from... Um, from the book, I'll send you some audiobook chapters. I'll send you loads of templates and cheat sheets and tips and best practices. I have free training that I offer and I do mentoring sweepstakes, all kinds of good stuff. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'm sorry I sound like this, you know, this cold sucks. 
uh, and I wish I didn't have it, but you have all been wonderful people. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Remember, my door's open. Give me a yell if there's anything I can help with. Jono at johnobacon.com and have a great event. Thank you.